How many people here already know Mike Triplett? Okay, we're done. <laughs> well, uh, good afternoon. Yeah, we, well, almost afternoon. Uh, so thanks for coming for this edition of, uh, of Founder Stories. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Mike here. Um, I probably first met Mike almost seven years ago when, uh, when I got to Columbus. Uh, and so he's been an incredible asset uh, to, the, to the region. Uh, and so it's, you know, a little background. Uh, Mike is born and raised in Ohio. Um, this is, this is going to come back as a recurring theme. Um, he uh, he did, did his undergraduate and graduate work at a, at a local institution. Was it already the Ohio State when you were there, or did they do the transition? It was always just the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll talk about licensing later. Um, and... Uh, has had a very interesting uh, career in terms of what he did post-graduate work uh, out of Ohio State uh, in large organizations, large private companies, large um, um, research organizations, um, and then entering into the startup community. And so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail there because I actually think that's integral to one of the first questions for Mike, which is why. So why, do, why are you doing what you're doing? How much time do we have? We've got 45 minutes before other people get to start asking questions. All right. So if you want to talk about why, for me, it's, it's been an interesting journey that looking back, I can make sense of it. But going back to my, my background in East Liverpool, Ohio, which is over on the river, the tri-state of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, 38 miles from Pittsburgh. And... It was a quintessential 20th century city up until 1981, and I'm old enough to remember pre-1981, and then what happened during the 1980s, early 1990s. So what happened in 2008 and 2009 in the Great Recession was trivial compared to what places like East Liverpool, Ohio went through in the 1980s. And it was, socioeconomic devastation when the steel industry collapsed. In my elementary school experience, it were, I, I was surrounded by friends and kids that would come to school crying because mom and dad were breaking up because dad was going to Texas and mom didn't want to go. The bank was taking the house. The cars were being repossessed. This factory was closing down. This store was closing down. And that, that experience led me on to a, a journey of trying to understand how that happened. And for me, too, I'm a first-generation college graduate, so I lived it from my father being president of the local union, going on strike, and, and ultimately the factory shutting down when I was probably 12 or 13. And understanding, it took me a while to understand the connection to economic development and renewal and sustainability and innovation. And so I it became passionate about understanding that intersection of innovation and really economic development. And, and that, had, that led me on to, the, to a career in engineering. And I was motivated first by my own economic um, opportunity and security, given, given the background. So I went to Procter & Gamble down in Cincinnati, and I was there for about two and a half, three years, probably not the best employee in the world at the time. But I learned, I learned innovation on a global scale from a world-class chemical company. People think of Procter & Gamble from their marketing and finance, but they're really a, a chemical company. And at the time, P&G defended six areas of chemistry and invested in six areas of chemistry from which almost every product flowed that we see in, in the store shelves at, at Target or, or wherever. Um, but they had a pharmaceutical business. I was very interested in the pharma business to try to make a positive impact. And they made it known to me that without an advanced degree, I wouldn't be doing R&D. So I ended up back at Ohio State getting my doctorate in chemical engineering, focusing on nanoparticle drug delivery. And, but the entire time was focused on applied engineering for impact, for innovation, for, again, going back to the why, for having a positive impact in our society from a, whether we're improving human health or creating economic opportunity for people around us. And that's the abbreviated version. That's perfect. Thanks. And so the, the drive from 
or direction from P&G to, to go get an advanced degree. Was it always your intent to go back into industry or was there ever any, any allure of staying in the academy? There, good question. So I was, I was a National Defense Science and Engineering graduate fellow, DOD fellowship in, in grad school, even though I have no military uh, experience. I wasn't certain, but I knew I was applied, and I was recruited on a number of faculty interviews. The first was Carnegie Mellon, and I was in Pittsburgh for that two-day experience, and I grew up 35, 38 miles from there, and I thought, you know, Carnegie Mellon might be a great place to, to launch an academic career, and they have a reputation for being very entrepreneurial, so that re resonated with me, but after about two hours on campus, I, there was no way, no offense to, to my faculty friends, but I was definitely not going into the, the university or the academic route, so I turned my attention to uh, opportunities within, within the private sector, and it turned out that the basis of my, the same technology that I was using to make lipid nanoparticles at Ohio State, Battelle, that large research organization next door, had spun out a respiratory therapeutics company in Grandview, along with a number of investors and pharma companies like Pfizer, and they were using the same technology, so it made sense for me to walk across the street and join that, and that was my first real taste of venture. And that sort of opened my eyes to innovation really can happen outside of the big corporate. It can happen in both, and I'm not a big believer in the distinctions. It can happen in both, but I think it's easier to do more cutting edge research outside. And so <clears throat> talk about that, that transition uh, into the, the, the work that was being done at Battelle uh, and being done in the, the spin out from Battelle and you know, what, what experience that gave you and kind of what you learned from that. Sure, Joe, would you like to answer? <laughs> Joe worked with me at Battelle on some of those activities. So it was, it was what, I, what I learned first and foremost was the need to be laser focused on value creation. At times, Battelle, and we exported that culture into that early stage company, at times we wanted to go solve that technical question that really didn't link toward value creation. So what I took away from that experience was laser focus on value creation and, and de-risking. Sometimes they're one and the same, sometimes they're not. And every once in a while, particularly with a startup that's out of a university or a big research institution, you can end up chasing those scientific or technical questions that don't necessarily translate to building value. So I took that discipline away from that, which also mapped back to Procter & Gamble and how they drove their projects and innovation. At P&G, we had, the, the threshold was, um, an ROI or NPV target. Every project was held to an NPV or ROI target or hurdle rate. And if you drop below that hurdle rate, you had X amount of time to get back above that or that project was, was cut. So talk about that a little bit more from the perspective of value creation because that's an example of, of economic metric for value creation. But there's other kinds of value creation related to you know, a, a nascent technology. Yeah, good, good question. So I think, and it's a balance, and you're absolutely right. Some, some would, re, you know, if you think about how, how to do good diligence, uh, for me, when, to answer that question, I think about, I want to know that there's a buyer at the end of the day. Uh, so value creation for me in a process could be getting confirmation or positive signals from potential buyers that if we hit certain milestones, either clinical data or technical development, that somebody would be interested in funding or buying. That's critical. Um, then there are just pure technical performance, things that you know you have to ultimately get to this end game of, of value, economic value. You need to be in your development plan making progress against certain technical development milestones as well. So, that so as you progressed in Battelle, mm -hmm. talk about some of the other projects and activities you worked on and then the, you sort of your transition hmm. post that. 
I'm thinking only because I'm trying to think about what I can talk about uh, in that context. You protect the guilty, the innocent, <laughs> you know. So for me, the evolution actually came down to, I think, Barbara Coons. And, and Dan, you know Barbara. Barbara was a previous leader of the Health and Life Sciences business at Battelle. She was, she was quick to recognize when I was recruited then to Battelle after, after the spin out company failed. Uh, she, she was quick to recognize that I had a, an interesting, or it, as she said, a unique capability or ability to see across really deep science and technology at the National Labs or at Battelle and the commercial the business side of that and sitting at those interfaces. And I had always thought that way. It took me a while to realize that well, most people didn't think that way. So early in my career, I often wondered, am I really just a bad engineer? Because I think about these things that a lot of the other ones don't. Or do I have a really a unique capability? And Barbara provided some, some positive confirmation that, that that's a really unique skill set. And then I took over leading strategy or innovation investments. Dan, you were part of some of those as well. And we did incredibly well and, and flourished. And in, in I flourished in that capacity. And a lot of people recognized it and then progressively just took on more and more innovation leadership or stri strategic planning type roles within health and life sciences. But I was also working with Battelle Ventures, the external uh, venture fund that Battelle had, corporate venture fund, based in Princeton, New Jersey, and supporting corporate ventures internally as well. And all of that just came together, and I, it was, you know, I was finally in the right position to translate, really to translate world-class science and technology into, in my opinion, high-impact businesses. But then you subsequently punched out a Battelle. I did. And what, and what precipitated that? So there, are, there were a number of investments and opportunities that people like Dan and Joe and I and others wanted to pursue. And at the time, we were not given the freedom to do that. So admittedly, I was a little bit frustrated by the, by the limitations at the time. And, but more importantly, I also going back to the innovation theme, wanted to go really experientially live innovation from the startup and early stage side, more so than I had coming in later in the stages of the respiratory spin out. And I wanted to go do that, so it was Alex Fisher, now with the Columbus Partnership, who he and I had worked together with Dan and Joe at Battelle before he went to the partnership. Alex connected me to an opportunity locally to run a, a combination device, medical device therapeutic play, a company that spun out of technology from Brigham Young University that the researcher had done his postdoc at Ohio State. The company was called N8 Medical and it still exists today. Uh, for me, that was where I, I think I got my experiential learning of how to lead a startup. And I was pretty green, but as what I wanted to do was to go out and, and live it from being in that captain seat which I, I took that experience and we built value in that company and today the company has breakthrough status on their medical device, lead medical device product and they're doing clinical trials XUS. So that company is going to be very successful and I you know, hope, hope they continue to, to, to make that progress because that product, that product will have a significant impact on hospital acquired infections as, as they move forward. So moving forward to the the origins of Myonexus. There was a situation where, you know, you were really, um, you, know, you, you weren't joining something that already had gotten assembled. You, know, the, you were you know, part of the, the um, activation energy, if you will. Um, and so talk a little bit about what kind of prepared you for and, and helped you make those decisions to, to put together a company around the technology out of children's. Good question. I'd, I'd point right back to my time at Battelle. I, I led, the one thing I skipped over is that I was the commercialization lead for health and life sciences, and I spent a lot of time in the national labs, Oak Ridge, Livermore, especially Livermore, looking at various technologies with others and thinking about how to take these really big ideas and big assets and technologies and quickly think about how 
how they would play in the marketplace, but then more importantly, how to go pressure test those hypotheses with investors and companies, again, trying to line up and get validation that somebody cares and somebody will pay for it at the end of the day if you succeed. So that experience was, was influential, but also most importantly, the thing I probably took the longest time to learn and, and it really paid off with my own Nexus was sizing up your ability to work with the inventor. In this, key, in this case, Louise Rudino Claypack, who is a brilliant, brilliant scientist, uh, just uh, and a wonderful person. And Louise was, and Matt, you can, you can attest to this, but Louise was a little, I think, skeptical and guarded at first by nature of working with an entrepreneur who really didn't contribute to the intellectual um, uh, development of the, of the te underlying technology. And it took me a long, it took me a while, not a long time, but it took me a while to build that relationship with her to, and, and get to the place where we were both convinced that we, could, we would work very well together. Now the, the thing about my nexus uh, in the structure of the opportunity and relates to children's created some both positives but also some challenges with respect to the, the, the multiple layers of involvement. Um, so I think it would help if people kind of understood what you were dealing with in terms of uh, there were a lot of uh, spinning plates that you were uh, keeping going. Matt, do you want to answer this? <laughs> <laughs> just, just forget he's here. Just don't. don't. You see what I, no, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to, to and this is, this is a challenge for any institution, any academic institution or academic medical center is how, and quite frankly, Matt, who leads the technology commercialization, is, has, I think, the, the hardest job of anybody because he's in, he and, and people like Matt and Andrew and their roles in tech transfer and licensing, they're having multiple conversations and negotiations at one time, often. They're trying to line up internal stakeholders, but also negotiate with the investors and or entrepreneurs. So in this case, Nationwide Children's, if people don't know it, and a lot of people unfortunately don't know it, but they're world class in gene therapy, particularly neuromuscular gene therapy. And when I go to Boston or San Francisco, people know Nationwide Children's Hospital, they know Ohio State, particularly in cancer as well. So the brand is incredibly strong and it's based on product productivity and the amount of innovation. So the, the hospital has been, in my opinion, really coming up uh, going up a, a learning curve, or mat I don't know the learning curve, but a maturation, I think, around processes of re re regarding commercialization. So we lived through some of those machinations within the hospital. But at the end of the day, the hospital was a fantastic partner, but it was really negotiating. From my perspective, I ended up, I needed to negotiate with Matt, but I also had to negotiate with Louise, and we had to more broadly deal with some 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 normal course of business activities within the hospital, I'd say. But at the same time, bring along other investors and, and co-founders in the deal. So it, looking back, I was probably in having four binary negotiations, and one was certainly with the founder, and the hospital was sort of a three-way negotiation. Is that fair, Matt? Well, the other layer on this, which I think some people may not know, and while it's not entirely unique in the in life sciences, it's certainly unique within Columbus, is the, uh, the fact that in NCH you can take things from fundamental research to the, the, uh, uh, the bench, to manufacturing, to the, to the clinic, to clinical trials all in the same institution. Now there are firewalls in place to, to prevent conflicts um, and, to, and to manage that because it's something the, uh, the FDA cares about deeply, uh, as we all do. Uh, but I think it's the, that um, you're managing that, that workflow and that process um, all within the same organization uh, you know, as, a, as a startup um, is an interesting dynamic. We could not have done what we did without the vertical integration <clears throat> that Nationwide Children's has, has developed. And Selenex benefited from it, for sure. And others, Matt has done other licenses in the last year or two that have benefited from the investments at Nationwide Children's over the last 10 to 15 years. From my perspective, Nationwide Children's has, has built a biotech company within the hospital. And they're, they're profiting from that 
tremendously, and we as a community, personally, but most importantly, the patients are benefiting. The backstory of gene therapy was about 20 years ago, there was an early clinical failure, a patient, a patient died in clinical trials, and most of the field, most of, most of the people abandoned the field. A lot of institutions walked away from it. Jerry Mendel here in Nationwide Children's Hospital, they didn't back away, they actually leaned in because they saw the promise. Jerry stuck with it, other institutions, also a handful dead. Um, and they've all, they've all done tremendous work along the way. But because of that lack of external support from investors, even NIH and NSF, the hospital took it upon themselves to invest you know, put, put their capital at risk. And tremendous, it's, it, it was a bold vision and a big bet and huge risk profile for a hospital of that size, particularly at that time in the evolution of the hospital to make those investments. And it is, it is a, it's a truly remarkable story. And again, it's getting a lot of national press, global press within the biotech space for how prolific it is. But when you, if you walk down, I forget how many, every, every week you go down, it seems like a new building's going up. Um, but you walk into the facilities around the gene and cell therapy space uh, arena at Nationwide Children's, it's every bit as good as what you see at Genentech in South San Francisco, every bit as what, good as what you see at Roche and Novartis in Switzerland, and I've been in all of those facilities. And if you close your eyes and, and don't recognize the surroundings, you would think you're in one of those facilities. So not counting the option payment from Sarepta, and I know that's not truly apples to apples, but how much did you raise mm -hmm. up to that point to continue the phase one clinical trials versus how much you think you would have had to have raised to done the same thing without the vertical integration at NCH? So we did, we only did a two and a half million dollar convertible note seed round and our series A target raise was minimally 30 million. Really we're pushing toward 45 to 50 in that and that 45 or 50 million would have allowed us to invest in commercial manufacturing development, which we were planning to spend $25 million over a two-year period to develop that manufacturing capability. And probably would have allowed us to take one, maybe two of those, con of those programs into the clinic during that period of time. And then we were contemplating what a Series B would look like or an IPO, depending on how much progress we were making and where the market was. But we were ballparking in early conversations and planning on a manufacturing facility of a 50 to $60 million number alone, let alone the headcount we'd have to add and, and the, the, the expense of running the clinical trials. So quickly, we would have been at several hundred million dollars in a couple of years. And you can look at any gene therapy company or biotech company, and they quickly get to a couple hundred million dollars raised pretty quickly within two to three years of launch. And so you did this with six employee, employees, um, the, the team at NCH. So talk about managing that, that dynamic with a, a, an inventor who was deeply involved, um, as, as opposed to in many cases, um, they're there in, a, in an advisory role, but not really truly engaged. But here's a case where you had somebody um, up to their neck in the, in the whole affairs of the company. It was, it was quite enabling, but also a challenge, challenging dynamic to manage. Essentially, we were outsourcing our R&D operation outside of manufacturing to Nationwide Children's Hospital and Louise Rodino Claypack's lab, and then the manufacturing operation. But again, that's also a strength, because otherwise we'd have to go pay others to do that. We had the benefit of time and continuity of knowledge within the hospital. It required, I had to draw upon my earliest experiences with, with Procter & Gamble when I was thrown to the wolves trying to manage a, a relationship between 3M and Procter & Gamble, two multi-billion dollar companies as a 22 or 23 year old, I was ill-equipped to do that, but I was able to draw on some of that and then we, we had strategic relationships at Battelle as well, strategic alliances that, that we had. And so we, along with Sarepta, you know, we, we joined forces to to think through how we could operate in more of a strategic alliance mode with the hospital. And, and, and that was, eventually we got there. We had to make uh, one or two hires, particularly one hire, to create more of a, a um, 
a better interface with the hospital to manage the relationships on the research side, and that was incredibly helpful. But it, again, it it was it was it was a challenging dynamic. What really made it challenging was the fact that Sarepta hired Louise and her team during the whole process. Said so, so we were managing this three-way relationship at one time where Sarepta hired the entire group that I wanted to hire to build around its at my own nexus. They hired and they're now building their R&D Center of Excellence for Gene Therapy here in Columbus right now. So you were out actually actively raising a, a, a major round of financing when Sarepta came in and offered the, the option. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting set of discussions and, and a, a strategy inflection. So talk about that a little bit in terms of how you made those decisions. Yeah, good, good question. Um, very early on, after, we, we knew early that we were in a hot space because as soon as we announced to the world that we existed, we started getting calls from leading biotech VC funds that, quite frankly, made a lot of money in Avexis and other gene therapy companies. And then we also, as we were continuing to do our, our BD, just relationship building with, with, with the pharma industry, they started to express strong interest in partnering with us and, and tying up with us in some capacity. So given, given that, we, as, as a group and the board decided, one, we should bring on somebody with more experience in running deals than, than what I have. So we, we brought on Peter Kleinhens, who is a, is a local, local um, gentleman who has a long history in, in venture and entrepreneurship and has sold a number of companies from his venture portfolio. So Peter came on board and ran uh, a process with the investment banks. We interviewed a number of investment banks and down-selected to William Blair out of Chicago. And we hired them essentially to run a dual-track process, dual-track in a sense of they, they could help us raise 50 to $60 million on an, on an equity round, a Series A, or they could help and they could drive a process on an acquisition or M&A type of uh, transaction as well in parallel. And Peter managed that, and largely before we really started or initiated that process formally, Sarepta, just the threat of that process, Sarepta came forward and said, here, we want to give you an option to take you off the market for two years, and we'll essentially fund your Series A, uh, all essentially non-dilutively to all the investors. And it, it was a really interesting dynamic, but what made it even more interesting is the fact that they also decided they wanted to hire Louise at the same time. And so we, I spent a lot of time with Louise, a lot of time with her thinking through, really at the end of the day, what did she want to do? And what was, it, it, these were her assets, her intellectual uh, contributions prim primarily. And given the fact that she ultimately came back and said she wanted to go. She loved this idea of going with Sarepta and trying to build something locally in Columbus that's permanent. Then I said, okay, let's, let's go do this and try to get the best deal we can get with Sarepta. And that's what put us on the tra trajectory to do that deal with Sarepta. Why did that work? Because when you think about it, your, your lead scientist is now working for somebody who hasn't actually bought the company yet. So why did that work? I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it's actually, I think it's because the other part of that equation of let's do this was really having those heart-to-heart -heart conversations with Sarepta to, to determine if they were, I don't want to say acting in good faith, but were they, could we trust them in this? Because, it, because we had the investment banker telling us, Hey, look, let's, let's not do this. We can live without Louise. We can replace her. And let's go see if we can get the best deal we can get with Pfizer and Novartis. And that's, so we had that conversation, but not terribly seriously. But I had developed a really good relationship with the corporate development lead at Sarepta over, over time, and then others within the senior leadership at Sarepta. And at the end of the day, I think the, the investor, the investment banker and, and the board looked at me and said, can you trust Sarepta? And I said, in my judgment, we can, we can trust Sarepta in this. We took a risk on, on them being true to their word, and, and they were. So when you look back on this whole process, 
and the outcome, which is interesting, we were talking about this just before the, the sat down for this session. Um, one of the one of the aspects of this particular transaction, there's there's no liability tail on MyoNexus, which is um, unheard of, frankly. Um, what would you never do again, assuming you could prevent it or avoid it? And what out of, out of this did you learn that you think is a, is replicable? I would never let a potential acquirer hire my chief scientist. <laughs> Is that put us in a, in, into a tight strategic box of how to work this deal with them? And it became an optimization problem within, within that. That, was, that is one that there's no strategy book or negotiation book that, that, would, that will prepare you for. So that was, that was definitely a challenge. And what was the other part of the question? What, what are the things that you because would do Because I lost sleep over that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably lost a little sleep. Yeah. Um, what, what things would, do you find is what you did that's repeatable? Well, I have a saying, and I, I know what I find is repeat, repeatable, and I think this is, I'll, I'll draw upon my engineering background, is I, I, I don't like startups. And I tell everybody, I do not like startups. And startups are a necessary evil, in my opinion, to drive innovation. But I think startups should, should fail fast, scale fast, or exit fast. And my, my, that mantra is what I take to every, whether it was a project inside Battelle or outside, that I, I think we should aspire to, to build a Roche at the end of the day, and we should do it as quickly as possible, or we should get these assets into the hands of somebody who can take them forward, like Sarepta. And, if, and we certainly don't want to throw good money after bad. If something is not going, I don't want to be wedded to any idea that really has no chance because there's an opportunity cost for everybody. And there's only so much capital to go around. So I would definitely, and I will definitely have that mentality. And I advocate for that mentality always. And that rubs people the wrong way when I say that. But I say it uh, with, with intentionality because I think that optimizes the outcomes for everybody. So that's a good transition into what's next for you. What are you, what are you thinking about? Um, you know, you could, you could have taken a bunch of time off here and, um, you know, gone off and contemplated all kinds of other things. But so what are you going to be doing? Well, let's, so we're still, so on the, on the we're not retiring, that's for sure. Um, my daughters tell me I need to find a job because they're tired of me being around. So I'm working, I'm working on that. In the meantime, I'm helping the Lieutenant Governor. The Lieutenant Governor John Husted, Innovate Ohio, asked me to lead a committee around life sciences to make strategic recommendations for the state of Ohio on policy and, and investments, let's say, in, in life sciences to drive innovation and entrepreneurship and economic development in the state of Ohio. The first priority is gene and cell therapy, so that, that activity is getting launched any day now. And then secondly, I've been doing a lot of work with the university to help them with, with various, various uh, initiatives. But in the background, my te the team and I are working on building the next, the next venture around gene and cell therapy. And we're, we haven't converged yet, but we have, a strong we have a strong leaning on which way we're going to go. We have, so so the, two, the two ideas are, do we, we can build another gene therapy company or cell therapy company. We know we can do that. If we do it again, I'm going to do it in a way that hopefully what I'd aspire to do is build, build a Roche or Pfizer here in Columbus, Ohio. I think we have all, the, all of the attributes needed to build an L Brands or Cardinal Health in, in therapeutics here. And there's no reason we shouldn't, uh, given the strength of the innovation and the talent that flows through this community and the, and the advantages around cost of doing business and access to particularly the East Coast. So that would be the end goal. So we can do it through one targeted company or we can, the alternative is we're thinking about a, a, a venture development holding company concept where we go get early stage assets and ideas out of Mayo or Mass General, Nationwide Children's, Ohio State. And we have a team that is really skilled at living in deep science and technology from a very early stage through 
an advanced state of maturity that could be transactable or spun out with a separate management team, et cetera. And we'd like to create scale across that and if, ideally throw off multiple companies that hopefully one would one or two would stay here and grow into significant uh, companies in Columbus, Ohio. So what are the, some of the things you, you think that the region uh, requires? You've talked about a lot of the, the mm -hmm. attributes that we have. What are some of the things that we still need in order to help facilitate that, that vision? I think you, you typically look at innovation, but I think on the innovation, the ideas here are very strong. I don't, I don't, I don't think we're lacking for ideas that you can build companies around. Look at, look at the exits we've had. Look at, look at the new investment that you see in Ohio State and in the immuno-oncology space. You'll see a tremendous amount of oncology opportunities start to flow from Ohio State over the years. Nationwide Children's continues to invest in gene therapy and also increasingly cell therapy. So that's not the issue. I think the most immediate thing we need is infrastructure. We need a facility or two, like a Cambridge Innovation Center or a Cortex down in St. Louis, we need, we need that, that facility that can house life sciences companies. We have limited capacity here at Rev1, uh, and that's it. Uh, we, I've known companies that relocate, they go down to Athens, Ohio to get lab space from Columbus or they just pick up and move out of, the, out of the area because there's nowhere to go. An early stage company cannot afford to, to take two years to build a facility and invest in infrastructure like that. The investors won't tolerate it. And so we're at a, we're, we're at a competitive disadvantage in that regard, but you and I both know there are a lot of discussions around that, so I'm hopeful that we can, we can make inroads very quickly in that locally. And then we, we, we still need to facilitate more capital early stage capital. Uh, Rev1 has, has, has done an excellent job of, of growing the capital base here. Nationwide Children's, Ohio State have, have stepped up. Uh, I think we, we need to do more and hopefully create some uh, more funds, some follow-on funds, particularly in, in therapeutics when you're talking about 40 to $50 million Series A. We don't have a lot of that capacity around. Hopefully we can get there. And, and then finally, we, we need we need more, we need to facilitate more of that entrepreneurial talent. I think Rev1 plays a strong role there. I think Ohio State can, can do more, and I think we'll do more with the Keenan Center for Entrepreneurship. I'm on the search committee there. Uh, an alum gave a significant amount of money to stand up that, that center. And in fact, after we're done here, we have a, a call, a search committee call to review the, final, the finalists on that and hopefully we'll see some progress there but I think driving that culture locally would be important and the other reason I want to help stand up a, a company in a therapeutic space that is permanent here is because Dan you made the leap several of us made the leap out of the big corporate environments I think there is tremendous corporate or tremendous entrepreneurial talent and it often resides within a large companies but the opportunity cost here is huge because what happens if you don't if you don't hit it, if it doesn't succeed, well, it's not like you're just going to go over and have coffee at the Catalyst in Cambridge and, and probably get two or three offers within two days for the next venture or to go right back into Biogen or wherever. So creating some diversity of opportunity as well is something that I think is important for the ecosystem as we move forward. That's good. It's a good uh, transition to questions in the audience. tax structure in Ohio is for what you want to do? Do you think it is, because uh, you, you know, you've got to have some kind of help from the government. I mean, we're not, not going to tell you what to do, but they got to make the environment, um, you know, very fruitful for what you're thinking about doing, because we've not done that in Ohio. So what's your opinion of the uh, tax structure? I guess so. You know, actually, the state of Ohio, maybe not a tax structure on, let's say, the exit side. There are certain states that they have no capital gains tax. And people all the time ask, it's, like, it's kind of like an estate tax issue. 
for people on the capital gains. There's some people that will optimize their geographic location to avoid those capital gains. And, and you'll have financial advisors point that out as one of the first things to you that if you think there's going to be an exit, you should relocate to Tennessee, Texas, or Florida right away. But my wife and I chose not to do that because that's gaming the system and we have daughters in middle school. It's not fair to them. But, you know, it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate issue. But then I, I argued the other side as well. Is it fair if you have a windfall to avoid taxes when other people are working, you know, 12, 16 hours a day paying ordinary income, which are significantly higher anyway? But at the state level, it's all normalized. But the state of Ohio has done a good job with, over the years, with third frontier funding and other funding mechanisms. So the state has been a catalyst and an investor. And, and so on that front end, they've, they've done a good job. I think, you know, Rev1, the great work that Rev1 has done has in part been catalyzed over the years by state funding. Same thing in Cincinnati and Athens and Cleveland. And part of the Innovate Ohio mission, quite frankly, is to look at some of those mechanisms and, and, and topics as we move forward. So, you know, that could certainly be on, on the agenda for the work at Innovate Ohio as well. Yep. Mike, uh, it, it, first of all, for the group, it cannot be overstated how well Mike navigated the multiple relationships he needed to establish and maintain and get, you know, disparate third parties to work together and so on and so forth. So kudos to you, Mike, on that front. But one I wanted to focus in on a little bit, you talked about your relationship with Louise and how um, one of the biggest tasks you have was navigating when some of her interests shifted. And so speaking as an entrepreneur that's now successfully taken a, a technology out of academia, can you speak a little bit to best practices when it comes to building that relationship with the investigator? From a structure perspective, how do you align them with the company? How do you build it? What, what was your, your best advice to people that are at that place in their career right now? Yeah, good, good question. I've, I, I learned this from, ex, from experience and, and where it didn't go so well in the past and where it did go well with Louise. First and foremost, I actually slowed down, took the time to actually get to really know her and really practice, I would say, active learning or active listening and thinking my way through what she was telling me and reflecting it to her to see if, to see if what I was hearing or had heard actually aligned with her. And, and the, other, the other thing is that you have to really quickly calibrate what their level of understanding is around commercialization and what it means to be an entrepreneur. And, and they come, and the inventors come with different, different levels of, of understanding. So it's not a one size fits all. Some are very sophisticated, some are, are not. Louise was very sophisticated in certain levels given the experience in other areas, not so much. And, but like you flip it around, I, wasn't, I was uh, naive to some of the aspects of her technology. And that was the other piece is that you have to make sure that the inventor knows that you respect their, their science and what they know and get to the place where you but, you, but you also want to get to the place where you can ask probing questions and challenge. And you have a good back and forth. And when you can have that back and forth with the inventor on certain technical aspects and then they'll come back to you on the business side, that's when you know you have it about right, when it's still respectful and, and, and good. And, and then it really just came down to respecting Louise and her intentions and desires. Because I could have, and you know, some of the investment bankers aren't one to, to necessarily be empathetic and care about the concerns of, of certain people, but this was Louise's life, life's work, this and microdystrophin. So I was not going to do anything. I wanted to respect that, honor that with her, and wherever she wanted to take this, I would try to create the biggest. We were partners, really, at the end of the day. We were partners in this. It was not me coming in as the entrepreneur, the CEO, or the president of the board, or whatever, saying, this is what we're going to do. That's, and it was, it was really a, a, a relationship that I tried to develop with her and, and make sure that we aligned on interests, but then also on incentives. So getting her well compensated from an 
an equity standpoint and making sure we are all pointed in the same direction. She wins, we win. And the same for the hospital. We all, I wanted all the, everybody to be aligned and pointing in the same direction. So we're all in the same, same team with the same, same motivations. We've got another question over here. I think I have a question uh, in continuation with the relationship with the investor or investigator who is, an in, uh, who is a full-time faculty at the university. So if you look at the history of innovation that has come from academic medical centers or universities, there are many investigators who are full-time faculty. So what is it that made Louise, in your opinion, quit her daytime job to be part of this? Because a lot of in, uh, inventors don't like to do that. They're in academia to invent, give that off to somebody else, and move on, number one. Two is, do you see a difference working in your experience with early stage academic investigators versus advanced f folks who are in, at their advanced stage of career? Good, <clears throat> good question. So the first one, I think Louise speaking for her, so it's always dangerous to speak for her, but my, my assessment is that she realized that Sarepta would be in a position to move the assets forward more quickly because of their resources and infrastructure, their avail availability of capital and ability to, to raise more capital and under her leadership. And they were willing to invest around her and build out a team. So you put all that together, it, it gave Louise the opportunity to maximize the impact that she could have for this patient population globally on, a, on the fastest time scale possible. In this patient population, they have, they have no hope outside of these gene therapies that are being developed now by Louise and colleagues at Sarepta. So at the end of the day, I think go back to what has really made the Center for Gene Therapy special at Nationwide Children's Hospital is the people involved in that center, yes, they like to personally profit, but they are mission driven. They are focused first and foremost on making a positive impact in that patient population and Sarepta gave Louise the opportunity to accelerate that impact, and, that, and that's why I think she went there. And secondly, your, your, your second question, you know, I don't think it matters what, if you're young, you're old, advanced, early, I think it really comes down to what, what motivates you, and do you have the intellectual agility to operate within strategic, in, in different strategic environments? And Louise certainly has that. Others, and that's part of my assessment of PI as well, or the inventor as well. Can they, can they do they have agility to operate in different strategic constructs? And, and Louise, Louise certainly has that. So it, to me, it's not uh, a simple, simple answer. It's case by case specific. Yeah, this actually follows up a little bit on that. I know your priority is to build new companies, but what about someone like myself? I've got an early stage drug development idea that could accelerate into a late stage pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. As opposed to starting a company, trying to find investors like what you did, what about just going to Scripps or somebody and saying, here, run with it? Tell me why I shouldn't do, do that as opposed, to, <laughs> as opposed to doing what you did. Actually, Matt may be the best equipped to answer that one because that's something we dealt with at Battelle too. Do, is this something we want to spin out or is this something we just want to license directly to a larger entity? And one, I think it can, you, only you can answer what you want to accomplish for your career. And, and, and then two, you know, a license requires a certain set of criteria. Not all, not all assets are licensable to a larger organization given, on the, given their state of maturity and the risk profile around them. Some, the only path forward is a, a new venture. And I don't re recall the specifics of your opportunity, but if you don't have people around you who can help you think through that and make that assessment, I, I think folks that, that the university should be able to help you with that. And I know we've spoken about that in the past, but theoretically they should be able to help you and there's new leadership there. Uh, and 
I have a, I have a high degree of confidence in that, that new leadership, and I'm very optimistic about where that office is going. And then organizations like Rev1 certainly, certainly can, can help guide and advise as well on that. Well, that you own, that you own. They're out. Okay. Well, it, 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 it simplifies some things in the process. But it, it, one of the things that, that your question, Bob, kind of brings up is that whole issue of relative risk. Because you had some investors that initially were interested, but then, well, they'd rather see you at phase two clinical trials, not phase one. Um, the, uh, other um, the pharmaceutical companies weren't quite ready yet to make the, the leap into gene therapy. Uh, but in the negotiation with Sarepta, you had very specific milestones that you created as, as proof points, uh, risk reduction. So, you know, talk about that a little bit in the light of what Bob was just, uh, the question he was asking. Well, with, with, with Sarepta, it was, so essentially the deal we had was they gave us an option we were supposed to use that option money to fund our Series A. Those milestones, one, were showing progress. And at each one of those milestones, which were development points, whether starting manufacturing, starting a clinical trial, producing clinical data, Sarepta would, would have an option to exit that, that option or the opportunity to exit the option at each one of those decision points. But to maintain the option, they had to pay us a milestone back, which was essentially replenishing our option. They were paying in arrears, I guess, our Series, our series A against those milestones. So it was, a, it, was a novel, it was a novel construct that I liked because, again, we were, all, uh, we, were, we were all in the same alignment on what we were trying to accomplish moving forward. Um, as it relates to, to, to Bob, you know, and I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, it's a case by case. Every, every case is very unique in, in, in what's going on. And gene, gene therapy is, is incredibly hot. Cell therapy is incredibly hot. And I know, Bob, you're in a little bit of a different area. So it has a different dynamic. So again, those, those contextual aspects drive different, different paths forward. Other questions in the audience? All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank Mike for his time.